Okay. Something is wrong. Do you see the uh, slide? Yep. yep. Okay. I didn't get that. Could you try oh. again? Sorry, yeah. see, I don't need you right now. I don't have an answer for that. Is oh. there something else I can help? No, with? no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. So, uh, uh, so this is the lecture of March 31st and a couple of logistics. So welcome back from Stream Break, first of all, and I hope everybody has been safe. And uh, there's no class on Wednesday. I made up all the classes I missed already. So uh, we have only the regularly scheduled Tuesday and Thursday classes. And uh, I posted homework number five yesterday, and I'm working on a solution set for the homework number four, so it gets posted soon, I hope. And we will have class on Thursday. And so today from 5 p.m. we have an office hour. So uh, uh, there is a link uh, from, on syllabus. And I also try to actually copy the links of the Zoom uh, link uh, to the calendar. So you don't need to uh, go back to syllabus every time. You just go to the calendar and you can find the Zoom link from there. So that may be easier for some of you. And uh, uh, so we also have discussion section. Oh, so this today is typos. As, as it's actually Thursday, 5 p.m. Sorry. Ah, uh, Siri, you don't. Could you please repeat uh, what you said? Okay, I, I want to turn you off. She can be useful sometimes, but uh, okay. I don't need you right now. Sorry about that. Okay, and. Uh, <laughs> I was Siri, and uh, so uh, I, I was asking if you have any subjects you want to be uh, have see covered in discussion section. So I already got a couple of ideas, but if you have some other ideas, please email me, and so I try to actually address them as much as I can. Okay, so that's logistics. Any questions? Uh, sorry, is the discussion section today or Thursday? No, no, this is a typo. Sorry, oh. let me correct it right now. Uh, Okay, any other questions? Yoshi, sorry, there is also a, like a screen on your screen, I think like a build FX something. I'm sorry? There is like a build FX screen on, on the presentation on the right side. Build, oh, is that right? Is that what you see? Build effects. I don't know what that is. Does everybody see the same thing? Yeah, there's yeah. a one. Yep. Yeah, oh. What is that? Widget that says build order, no build effects. Ah, okay. Probably yeah, this one. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Is it gone? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay, good. So uh, let, let me move into the lecture. So as I advertised uh, already some time ago, we are starting part three of Pascal Schroeder, and that's a lot mostly about non debate engaged theory in the Higgs mechanism. So the first question I'd like to ask is a little bit of motivational stuff about the gauge uh, theory in general. So why do we care about the gauge invariance uh, to begin with? And uh, Peskin Schroeder gives this motivation based on actually sort of phenomenological reasons. So there's a famous experiment called Deep in Inelastic Scattering Experiment that was a pioneer across the bay at SLAC at Stanford. And uh, that's an experiment where you uh, send a very high energy beam of electrons in high energy in those days. So that's something like a, a <clears throat> uh, 20 GV or something. But anyway, so you send in this uh, high energy electron beam and, and get that scattered off a proton at rest. So it's a fixed target experiment. You accelerate the electron from Linux and shoot it at the proton and you observe the lepton after the scattering. So it turns out that this is sort of the analog of the Rutherford experiment at much higher energies to probe what's inside proton. And as, as everybody knows, the Rutherford experiment is firing off an alpha particle on a gold foil, and uh, the alpha particle gets scattered off the gold nucleus. And so even though it's actually a very thin foil, the <clears throat> The, 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 uh, the Rutherford was surprised to see the alpha particle getting bounced backwards from the thin foil. And he claimed things like, I forgot exact phrase, but it was like shooting a cannon at a tissue and saw the cannon firing back at you or something like that. 
So that was the, the reason why Rutherford concluded that the, much of the electric charge inside the atom is concentrated at the very center within a very tiny volume. And he could even estimate the size of the nucleus from this experiment. So in the same way, by firing high energy at the electron on the proton, and as long as the momentum transfer, so how much momentum of electron changes in a scattering event, uh, is uh, the momentum transfer is larger than the inverse size of the proton, so h bar over m proton c, then yeah, you find that uh, the, the electron then has a resolution of probing what's going on inside the proton. So that is exactly the same idea as Rutherford. And as a result, again, there was this observation that something uh, actually sort of almost backscatters an uh, electron. So there seems to be something inside a proton which is very point-like, where the electric charge is concentrated. And, and so that would act like a, almost a free particle. And, and so that was actually a big surprise uh, experimentally because proton was supposed to be doing a strong interaction and it binds uh, the nuclei together with the neutrons and it's always a very strong interacting particle. And it, it has been also known that its charge is actually is, uh, has a spatial extent of something like 0.7 Fermi. Fermi is 10 to the minus uh, 15 uh, meters femtometers, and so it was actually sort of, uh, sort of pictured as something like a rubber ball or something like this. So the charge is sort of uh, more smoothly distributed. So the picture people had was more like a, uh, uh, this, uh, the pudding model uh, of the atoms. But having done this experiment, they have seen that they actually point like objects inside a proton and that eventually became quarks as we know today. And, and the more, more surprising thing is that these quarks seem to be moving nearly freely uh, in these scattering experiments. Namely that if you do just simple computation of the point like Dirac fermion, which is the quark, and the point like electron coming in, and they exchange a photon to scatter against each other, that calculation does explain the data very well. So, so that is an evidence that the quarks, uh, whatever object inside a proton may be, are actually moving nearly freely. But on the other hand, we also know that these quarks can never be isolated out of the protons. And we have never seen object of the charge two thirds, which is the up quark, or negative one third, that is a down quark. We have never seen those objects. So we know the quarks cannot ne can never be isolated. So they are, what we say is that they are eternally confined inside a proton. So, so there must be very strong force binding them together so that you can never separate them from the proton. And that actually requires a very new kind of force we have not seen before, namely that this force has to be very weak at high energies because in this high energy scattering experiment uh, where lepton is sent in and scattered against these quarks, so at these high energies, quarks behave freely. Therefore, the effect of these, uh, this new force has to be weak at high energies, but it has to become strong at low energies because when you try to separate a quark away from the proton, then there must be such a strong binding force that you should be never be able to do it. That's why they are confined inside. So that is the kind of force we have never seen before until this moment. So uh, uh, people start to look for theories that would lead to the behavior of the force where the force becomes weaker at high energies but becomes stronger at low energies. And that is what we discussed uh, with this minimization group argument before. So if the beta function is negative, because the beta function is how the strength of the force changes as a function of the, uh, the energy scale where you're probing the force. And if the beta function is positive, that means that it becomes uh, large, uh, sorry, the smaller, uh, sorry, the, whatever. if the beta function is positive, then the force becomes stronger at high energies and becomes weaker at low energies. And that's the behavior you have seen in QED the last semester. But here we are looking for something the opposite. So therefore we need to find a force whose beta function is negative so that when you go to high energies, the negative beta function means the force becomes weaker and weaker. On the other hand, when you go to longer distances, that's IER, then the force becomes larger and larger. And at some point we believe the force becomes infinitely strong. 
So that actually started a sort of search for theories in three plus one dimensions, which exhibit this kind of a negative beta function. And uh, there was a famous paper by uh, Anthony Z uh, at, at Santa Barbara, who looked at every possible renormalizable field theory in four dimensions and concluded that none of them had negative beta function. But there was an omission. The omission was the non-abelian gauge theory, which people didn't quite know how to quantize it at that moment. So, you know, to, 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 to defend him, you know, he didn't know how to deal with it, so he didn't study it. But it's, it, it happened later on, uh, as shown by uh, uh, Politzer, uh, who, who was a grad student at Harvard back then, and, and the, uh, uh, David Gross and Frank Wilczek, and uh, at Princeton, uh, the, uh, David Gross was a professor and Frank was a graduate student. Uh, these three people discovered that non-Navidian theories alone have negative beta function. And so uh, uh, it, it turns out that uh, you have other theories that have negative beta function in other dimensions. You have seen an example of this actually in the uh, two-dimensional nonlinear sigma model. So in other dimensions, there are other theories that exhibit negative beta function, but specifically in four dimensions, the non evident gauge theory is the only type of theories that lead to negative beta function. So that's why the strong interaction had to be described by this non evident gauge theory, and, and that's the main motivation Peshkin Schroeder describes in this uh, sort of introduction section in part three. And so this experiment of sending electron high energy and getting scattered off the proton is called deep inelastic scattering, where the word deep is supposed to mean that you're probing deep inside the structure of the proton, but it's inelastic because it actually scatters against the quark inside. So it actually kicks out the quark out of the proton. But quark can never be isolated, as I said earlier. So what quarks end up doing is actually create another pair of quark and anti-quark as it goes on, and, and it actually gets dressed up to a, a combination which can be isolated, called the meson. And we come back and talk about this later, so don't, don't worry too much about it. So you know, this scattering experiment ends up producing a bunch of particles coming out from the scattering process. So that's why it's inelastic. Namely, the proton sort of breaks up into many, many uh, debris from this uh, uh, the scattering experiment. So that's why this is called deep in the scattering experiment. And uh, the, the Taylor from MIT was the leader of this experiment who received Nobel Prize for this, and two other people together with him. I think I forgot their names. I, I should have looked them up. Apologize. But anyway, so this is a uh, sort of historic moment. I think happened around uh, 1969 or something, you know, before I was uh, doing any physics. But uh, this is a very important moment in the history of particle physics where we have discovered sort of new layers of the matter, uh, much below the structure of the protons and neutrons, down to the level of quarks and gluons, as we talked about uh, later on. So that's one historical reason why we want to talk about non abelian gauge theories. Okay, uh, any questions about this? It's okay? All right. But there's yet another reason, uh, which is much more sort of theoretical, uh, that was uh, 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 discussed earlier by Jan and Mills. And, and that's why the non living gauge theory is also sometimes called Jan Mills theory. And their argument uh, was the following. So we all know symmetry is very important in physics. So if you have a field theory, and we have talked a lot about something like this, so let's say you have a complex scalar field, and you're allowed to change the phase of the complex scalar field, and let's say that's a symmetry. And that will lead to a conservation of the total number of particles. Right? So that's something we, we talked about before. So uh, the uh, symmetry always leads to conservation law, and we actually make use of this conservation law to classify different states and different dynamics, and so the symmetry has been always important for us. But when you look at this form of this U1 uh, uh, trans uh, symmetry, so this is the, uh, called U1 because the phase is a one-by-one one unitary matrix, so uh, this is a U1 symmetry, but the, uh, the, the, the issues that Young and Mills worried about is the fact that this phase has to be the same for the entire space-time. And that seems to defy the concept of causality because 
Now, the, the, the information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So if you want to do this symmetry transformation, and if you do this at one point in space-time, but if you're supposed to do it the same way at another point in space at the same moment, then there is no way for observer here and observer there to actually know what phase they're supposed to use together. So uh, to be able to do this transformation with a constant phase throughout the entire space-time seems to defy the idea of causality and hence violates the principle of relativity. And so that's what they worried about. So they basically said the symmetry must be local. And then we know a local symmetry, that's a gauge symmetry. So you have seen that in QED. I, I'm going to actually review this once again so that to refresh your memory about this. So in gauge symmetry, you are supposed to do this phase change of the field arbitrarily from one space to position to another position. So then there is no issue that you're supposed to say that you choose the same phase ever in space time. Everything is local. So every observer would choose different phase. So there's no need to sort of coordinate uh, for the entire space time. So uh, that's why the gauge symmetry seems to match much better the idea in relativity. So uh, the symmetry must be local. That's what they uh, uh, basically said. So the local symmetry, therefore, is something very important, and, and that's why we should care about it. And so there are actually more recent arguments why symmetry has to be local. So this argument put forward by, I think, Sakharov first, and, and uh, uh, is, is the following, uh, uh, maybe Rubikov, actually, I'm sorry, uh, I think it's Rubikov. Uh, so the idea is that, well, black holes are uh, supposed to have three hairs, which are the mass, elliptic charge, and angular momentum and black hole carries no other information. So uh, if you actually throw in something into the black hole, then that's lost forever. And so, uh, so if you think that something conserved, like the uh, number of atoms, for example, and if you throw that into the black hole, then you know, for black hole doesn't care if that was an atom or book or whatever else. So uh, all that cares about is that the mass has increased so the conservation law in this case, the number of atoms in this U1 symmetry, uh, is, it seems to be violated by the existence of black holes. And more, much more recently, there has been this idea called the swampland conjecture, which has to do with what kind of theory is consistent with the ultimate uh, the, 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 the description by the string theory. And the argument has been that the string theory has no exact global symmetries just like this U1, where you change the phase of the field uh, everywhere in the same way. That's why we call this global symmetry. And the string theory doesn't have no uh, exact global symmetries. Uh, so every symmetry with the exact symmetry has to be local if you actually buy into this argument. So what Jan and Mills tried to do is to look at the isospin symmetry in nuclear physics, where you treat the neutron and proton to be identical particles. Indeed, their masses are very, very close to each other. And so that's an SU2 symmetry where you can rotate this doublet of proton and neutron in an arbitrary fashion. So that's the SU2 rotation, two by two unitary matrix. And that they wanted to actually make this SU2 symmetry local. And SU2, as I explained later, is one example of a non-Navidian symmetry because the generators don't commute with each other. So hence, the birth of the non abelian gauge theory. So that was the initial argument by Jan and Mills. And admittedly, this is very philosophical, uh, but if you have any questions, let me know. Um, how, so how, how can you have a uh, theory with a local symmetry? Like if I just choose for the, for, the, for the gauge field to be constant everywhere, doesn't that give me a global symmetry? How can you, can you explain that a little bit more? Uh, let's see, you said gauge field is the same everywhere? Not the gauge field, but like the... Uh, gauge transformation? Yeah, the gauge transformation is constant everywhere. Doesn't that lift to a, a global symmetry? Yeah, so, so, so uh, the, the reason I emphasize this the philosophical is that, you know, it, it may not be true. So the, the gauge, local gauge symmetry already includes a global symmetry in it because you are allowed to choose the phase the same everywhere in space-time indeed. I think that's what you're saying, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Was that Max? Yes. 
Oh, okay. So, uh, so you can certainly take the theta uh, to be the same ever in space time. But the point here is that you don't have to. And in fact, if you resort to this principle of causality, it would be impossible to coordinate uh, people, uh, the, uh, different observers at different places in, in, in space to choose the same phase together. So the, the fact that you are allowed to choose different from each other is the very important thing for them. And that's why they declare that symmetry has to be local. Yeah, I understood uh, that, that aspect of the argument, but okay. I about the statement that's like a, a string theory or something wasn't supposed to have any global symmetries, but still have local symmetries. I was ah, so that. yeah, okay, okay. So the statement is that if you do have a exact global symmetry, that has to be part of the local symmetry. Maybe if, if I phrase it that way, that makes sense better. Uh, yes. So they. So it turns out that the that the type of gauge symmetry they have is just more subtle. So it doesn't it doesn't uh, have a global manifestation. Um, so so it is still true that the gauge symmetry includes the global symmetry, but there is no global symmetry that is not part of the local symmetry. That's a statement. Oh oh sure okay all right okay okay. So that was the sort of historic argument by Yanu Mills, and, and this is still uh, kind of uh, being repeated in many different contexts. I have one quick question, though. Okay. So the consequences of causality seem to make sense. However, mm -hmm. um, theta seems to be like, how do we know it's not just a redundant parameter? And if it's like just a description, right? Then why do uh, yeah, I so, have to obey causality? Well, excellent. So that's the next slide, actually. So let me move to the next slide. So this is the historic view on why symmetry, uh, gay symmetry is important. And, but there is actually a, a more recent view uh, by uh, Nati Seiberg, and, and, uh, it, which is uh, getting more and more accepted these days. And they, it's the following idea. So the, as you all know, the gay symmetry started out with study of the electromagnetism, right? So you have these Maxwell's equations. You want to solve Maxwell's equations, and you use the vector potential for that purpose. But when you use the vector potential, you realize that it's not unique. For the same field strength, you could have different vector potentials that would reproduce the same field strength, and they, they're different. The vector potentials are related by the gauge transformation. So that's how it all started. But if you actually look at the Maxwell equations, uh, you know, it's probably maybe you haven't seen this for a while. Uh, you know, it's actually very strange if you think about this, because there are six unknowns. So electric field is a vector, so there are th three components. A magnetic field is also a vector, there are three components. Altogether, there are six unknowns. But if you count the number of equations, there are eight equations for them. So this Gauss's law is one equation, but this Ampere's law is three equations because curl B has three components in it. And this curl E, this is also three equations. And divergence less of the magnetic field is one equation. There's no index left. So altogether, one plus three plus three plus one. So you have six equations, uh, eight equations. So that's really strange. You have to set up the differential equations with six unknowns and eight equations. And normally, you would not have any solutions to that set of equations. But of course, we know we do. And it, it turns out that these equations are not totally independent from each other. And the reason we know it now is that you can actually use this word heuristic notation for the field strength f mu nu. And it turns out that this second line, both equations can be cast into the form of the epsilon mu nu rho sigma, del nu f rho sigma vanishes. So if you write this out into components, that will reproduce the second line of this curl E uh, equals to minus B dot, and the, grad, uh, the divergence B vanishing. So that's also part of these equations. And this equation actually turns out to be trivial if field strength is written in the form of this curl, uh, del mu A nu minus del nu A mu. So if you just insert this expression uh, of the curl into this equation, which is called the Bianchi identity, then this del nu and del mu inside the f mu nu are anti-symmetric because of this leverage vita symbol. And because the partial derivatives commute with each other, if you make them anti-symmetric, that identically vanishes, right? So, uh, so the, this, this second set of equations are trivial once you know that f mu nu can be written in terms of this form of the curl. 
In fact, this is the way people discovered the vector potential. And then the rest of the equation in the first line can be cast into the form, as you know, uh, of the divergence of F mu is the source current, uh, uh, the electromagnetic current. So these are four equations now. And now, to, to, now that we regard the spectral potential to be the, the, the unknowns instead of the field strength, then I have four unknowns because the vector potential has four components. And here you have four equations. Now, all of a sudden, it starts looking uh, uh, much more normal. And, and that's why we actually do find solutions to the Maxwell's equations. So this is something you know very well, but I'm just repeating it in a way that why we have to actually uh, go to the vector potential instead of keep using the field strength uh, for the electromagnetism. I stop here. Any questions about this? Okay. So yeah, now, had, okay, go ahead. Um, well, shouldn't you also regard rho and j, the, the four current, to also be dynamical in that you should include the force law here, and then you actually have more equations, but also more unknowns. Well, so the uh, J nu uh, uh, is, is really subject to one constraint, namely the continuity equation, because if you actually take del nu on the left-hand side of the equation, mu and nu are antisymmetric, so del nu, del mu, antisymmetrized identically vanishes. Therefore, del nu, J nu also needs to vanish. So this uh, uh, current is already subject to that constraint. Uh, this, that's the conservation of the electric charge, basically. Uh, but of course, in addition to it, J nu should be some form of the matter field. And so they, they are subject to their own equation of motion. So you, in the end, you have to solve the couple equations, not just this Maxwell equation, but J nu or matter fields in it are subject to their own equations which are in the presence of the electromagnetic field. And that's why the theory becomes nonlinear and in principle, it gets very complicated. And, and, and for example, there's something called the magnetohydrodynamics is, is one hot subject in astrophysics these days, where you try to understand the hydrodynamics of basically plasma, where you have a bunch of charged particles, they're interacting with each other and they have the collective motion. And, and it's a very difficult subject and uh, uh, they're still you know, very much under the research. So, so you're completely right. So when I write this Maxwell equation, I'm only focusing on the side of the solving equation for the electromagnetic field, but the matter side, that the source field also is subject to one equation and everything is coupled together. So it's actually a really nonlinear equation at the end of the day. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, uh, but I was also asking about the parameter counting, if that influences anything. I guess there's yeah. four new parameters, but one of them is taken away by charge conservation. Right. And then so, you have the first law, which has four components. So it seems mm -hmm. to also over specified. Um, so uh, the, 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 the um, uh, yeah, so the, the counting of the gives of freedom is actually subject to the next slide. So can I go to the next slide? And if you Absolutely. still have questions, you ask it again. Okay. So this is the way the vector potential was forced upon us, right? So that's why we discovered that there is a, a actually ambiguity in defining what the vector potential is. And that's the gauge uh, uh, invariance. And it turns out that it actually has a practical reason why that was necessary. So I said, now we have four equations of four unknowns, so that looks actually okay. But we still have a problem because for the photon or electromagnetic wave at the classical level, we know there are only two degrees of freedom. Uh, you can choose those two to be true transverse polarizations or two circular polarizations, but no matter what basis you pick, there are always two independent degrees of freedom, not four. So we're using this four vector vector potential to describe two degrees of freedom, which means that the description is redundant. And that's what Andres was uh, uh, referring to earlier. So we are using this description of the electromagnetism using four vector. And we have to use its entire four components because once you say something is a vector, Lorentz invariance tells us that it has to be a four vector. It needs to have four components. There's no object with only two components uh, in a Lorentz covariant fashion. So the four vector is forced upon us, but we know that there are only two degrees of freedom in it. So there is definitely a redundancy in description. So we need to somehow remove this redundancy. 
And so gaze invariance is actually the way of removing this redundancy because gauge invariance tells us two forms of vector potential, which are related by the gauge transformation, mean the same physics. So among these four components, there are some redundancy in them, which are not physical because they lead to the same electrom uh, the, the field strength. So that's how we can remove redundancy in this description. So the gauge symmetry, therefore, it's not really a symmetry. It's, it's actually a way of removing redundancy in our description where we try to describe electromagnetism with two degrees of freedom using a full vector to make sure that the description is Lorentz covariant. So it's just the gauge invariance is there for the proofs of removing this redundancy. It's not meant to be a symmetry of any sort. So that is the, the view promoted by Nati Seiberg uh, like 20 something uh, years ago. So any questions about this? Yeah, in what sense are there two degrees of freedom? I feel like I would say that there are three because gauge symmetry removes one and you yeah. start with four. So that I believe is the next slide. Okay, so th this is how it works if you actually use the Lorentz gauge. And, and depending on which gauge you, you use, how you remove extra two degrees of freedom uh, looks kind of different from each other. But this is the, how it looks like in Lorentz gauge. And we will come back and talk about this more when you go to the quantization of the non abelian gauge field using formalism called BRST formulation. But anyway, so I'm just giving you sort of a rough idea on how things are supposed to work. So suppose you take the Lorentz gauge, as I said, and what you would like to do is do the same kind of mode expansion you have been doing for the Klein-Gordon field and Dirac field. And Pushkin-Schroeder uh, uh, intentionally has been very vague about this in part one and part two, uh, if you noticed it. So they never really discussed how exactly that works, even though they spent a lot of time talking about mode expansion in Klein-Gordon field and Dirac field. Uh, but now, now, now we have to talk about this. So the A mu is the four vector potential. And this is the Lorentz covariant vo invariant volume. And you expand this in terms of the polarization vector and the creation addition operators. And uh, the, the Lorentz vector uh, is the uh, vector potential. So this feels uh, the uh, polarization vector should have the Lorentz index mu, the same index as the vector potential. But it could come in four different linearly independent combinations because they are four components, and that's labeled by this lambda. So this is basically a sort of a, uh, the, the label for uh, the, the, the polarization state of the, the vector potential. So for each lambda, you have a polarization vector, and for each lambda, you also have the set of creation annihilation operators. So the expansion should look something like this, which is meant to be summed over lambda. So that's a mode expansion. And so let's say you pick a particular reference frame that the P mu, that's a full momentum of the photon, is given by this. So the photon is moving along the z-axis. And because it's massless, the time component, that's the energy, and the z component, that's the momentum, are the same up to a factor of c, which I set to 1 uh, in the natural unit. So in this frame, you can easily identify two transverse polarizations where the epsilon mu one has a component in the x direction, which is transverse to the motion, which is the z direction, and epsilon two has a polarization vector in the y direction, which is also transverse to the direction of motion, that's the z direction. So these two polarization vectors are definitely physical polarizations we would like to keep. There's one polarization vector that doesn't satisfy this Lorentz gauge condition, which is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And Pushkin Schroeder calls this uh, polarization vector backward polarization because it's going in a backward direction from the motion of the momentum. So uh, it doesn't satisfy this Lorentz gauge condition because del mu a mu is basically the inner product of p mu, which is the del mu part uh, in the momentum space and the polarization vector epsilon mu, which is part of a mu now. So p mu dotted with epsilon mu doesn't vanish. So remember, the time component uh, times time component minus space component times space component is the Lorentz uh, inner product. So it doesn't vanish one plus 
minus one minus minus one is two, so it doesn't satisfy Lorentz gauge condition. So we remove it because of the gauge condition. But there is yet another uh, the, uh, 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 polarization vector, which is consistent with Lorentz gauge condition, which is exactly proportional to the full momentum. Because something proportional to full momentum plotted together p mu is proportional to p squared, that's zero for massless particle. So this one does satisfy the Lorentz gauge condition. But this is the direction, as I said, is proportional to the, uh, the full momentum. So if you change the gauge, a mu changes by the gradient of scalar function. And gradient in momentum space is full momentum. So you can change a mu by amount proportional to full momentum. That's the gauge invariance. And that's precisely this forward polarization vector. So if you have this uh, uh, annihilation operator that multiplies this forward polarization vector, this annihilation operator can be moved back in and off, in and out by the gauge transformation. Therefore, this A lambda for forward polarization is unphysical. So that's how you remove this degree of freedom from A mu, because that corresponds to something you can remove by gauge transformation. So that's how you start out with four in nearly independent components, but you remove one by gauge condition, you remove another by further using gauge transformation so that you end up with only two degrees of freedom at the end of the day. So this is the gauge invariance at work, namely that you are using gauge transformation to remove degrees of freedom from your description, namely you are reducing redundancy in a description, and that's how you end up with a Hilbert space that describes only degrees of freedom you really do need for your purpose. And we'll come back and talk more about this later, but I hope at least you get some idea how gauge invariance is supposed to remove redundancy in description. So any questions about this? Mario and Andres, are you happy now? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied. There's a Ooh. Sorry, I swear there's no fire, it's just the alarm. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay. So... There's the a bad feedback. I, <laughs> the only thing no, that was better. weird is the, is the fact that... The only thing that was weird is the fact that um, sometimes you can choose your polarizations to be like imaginary. And I'm not sure if that's related, but that didn't seem to make much sense when... I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get the question. Sometimes I do what? Sometimes you can choose your polarizations to also be like pointing in the imaginary directions. And I'm not necessarily sure if that makes sense. Or imaginary is that direction. Using... Yeah, because at least in, in what... Picking like circular slash elliptical polarizations instead of just linear ones. Is that what you mean? Uh, is that it? Is that it? Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's just the taking linear combinations epsilon one and epsilon two. So circular polarization corresponds to 0, 1, i, 0, for instance. So that's epsilon 1 plus i epsilon 2. And you can also look at epsilon 1 minus i epsilon 2. So those are the two linearly independent, circularly polarized, uh, the photons. Yeah, so under the, the imaginary part of the polarization vector could just be absorbed in e to the ipx, and then it just creates a phase shift. No, oh, okay, no, okay, okay. So, so. no, no, you cannot be absorbed into that. So the, the, the irrational part is there, but remember, A mu is permission, it's a real field, so plus complex conjugate takes care of it. Okay, that makes sense. So pretty much it's just a trick so that we can get circular polar light. That, that's that's all right. I'm that right. Okay, 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 okay. Cool, thank you. So it's sort of the similar to the idea that if you have spin one half, you have up and down states uh, along the z direction. But if you want to describe spin pointing in y direction, that will look like also one i, right? So it's the same right. idea. So you, you, you can choose different sort of the quantization axis or basis for polarization. And if you use the linear polarization, this epsilon one and epsilon two are the, the right basis. 
But if you want to use circular polarizations, you need to take the linear combinations between them so that they are eigenstates of the helicities of the uh, 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 of the photon, and that turns out to be zero i, zero one i zero or zero one minus i zero. But it doesn't conflict with the hermeticity of the, electric, the vector potential because you add a complex conjugate for the creation operator to make sure that everything is Hermitian. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Just okay. That part. Good. Any other questions? And as I said, we will come back and talk more details about this later, how that works in, in Hilbert space. Here, I'm just uh, describing this in terms of the operator, but in the end, we really have to talk about the Hilbert space to make sure that there's nothing unphysical in there. Uh, so we'll come back and talk about that. But anyway, any other questions at this stage? Okay, so, so far, it's just motivation. So now we talk about sort of mechanics of the gauge invariance, namely, you know, how exactly gauge invariance works. And of course, this is something you have seen before, so it's, it's all more, mostly refresher. But again, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. So the, 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 the first time you probably saw the gauge invariance is in the context of electromagnetism. The second time you saw it plays probably in the context of the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics. So here's the Schrodinger equation, and P is an operator, so it is actually uh, the h bar over i grad, uh, right? So uh, that's the Schrodinger equation. And if you do this substitution, so you uh, substitute uh, psi by this e to the i e theta of h bar psi prime, the psi prime is a new wave function, and a by a grad, uh, a prime plus grad theta, phi by phi uh, prime minus theta dot, if you just do the substitution, you find that uh, the form of the Schrodinger equation doesn't change at all. So that's the, the observation of the gauge invariance of the, uh, the Schrodinger equation. So this is the first time you switch from just changing the electromagnetic vector potential by the, uh, the derivative of some scalar function. But in addition, you have to do this phase change, namely the U1 transformation. So the connection between this gauge change of the vector potential and this phase change of the wave function uh, appears for the first time in Schrodinger equation. And I don't know if you got puzzled by this. I was when I first studied this. So I had to uh, try to understand why this phase and the gauge change are related to each other. And that's the next slide. So it turns out that uh, uh, the, this phase change is something you can understand because the classical action of the point particle coupled to vector potential is invariant under gauge change up to a total derivative. So that actually explains why it has to do with a phase. So here is the action of the point particle coupled to the vector potential. And so here I wrote it in manifested Lorentz invariant form. If you write this in components, it breaks down to this. So the time component, A0, is a scalar potential times dt. And the spatial component, uh, vector potential A, is coupled to dx. So that's uh, rewritten as the uh, x dot times dt. So that's a form of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the action uh, in the presence of the, uh, the electromagnetic potential. And if you do the gauge change on this, uh, which we fixed on the previous slide, then phi changes by theta dot, grad theta, uh, the A changes by grad theta, so the change of this action is given by this. And, and if you remember that this theta dot is the, the derivative of theta with respect to time based on its explicit dependence, but the second term here, grad theta dot uh, x dot, picks up the, the change of theta as a function of time through the change of the position as a function of time. So this is the total derivative of theta with respect to t by combining two terms together. And therefore, you can perform the time integral, and this ends up being the boundary terms. So value of theta at the final positions of final time minus value of theta at the initial position the initial time. So action changes by a total derivative and therefore by a surface term. But now you remember that this action is supposed to be an exponent in the path integral. So this is e to the i action over the h bar. So this action now changes by this surface terms. So that's this one here. 
And this path integral is supposed to be the amplitude from initial wave function to final wave function. So what came out from the surface term, which depends only on the initial position, should be multiplied on the initial wave function. On the other hand, this phase factor here depends only on the final position, which is supposed to be multiplied on the initial, the final wave function, that's the bra. So this one is a ket. So that's how you know that the total derivative term in the action turns out to be the phase factor on a wave function. So that's how you can understand why the gauge change in a vector potential has to be accompanied by this uh, change of the phase. That's what we determined in the previous slide. So that's why we're talking about this local U1 transformation, namely that you are changing the phase of the wave function, that's U1, in a way that can depend on space-time positions, hence local. So we are talking about local U1 uh, gauge symmetry. Okay, any questions about this? Good. I I guess everybody's familiar with this. Um, so uh, if you want to know more about this, the details of the working out the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the total derivative nature of this, uh, you can consult the uh, uh, lecture notes, potentials.pdf. This is something I wrote a long time ago uh, uh, for the 221A, but this could be useful for some of you. OK. So, um, uh, so the, uh, now that we are talking about field theory, of course, there are all these uh, transformation properties need to be lifted to the field theory Lagrangian. So this is the non relativistic Schrodinger field. We talked about this before, and we actually use it later on when we talk about actually Higgs mechanism, which has to do with the superconductivity. And that's when we actually use this Lagrangian to talk about superconductivity. And, and anyway, so this Lagrangian does have the same symmetry because what appears here is basically exactly the same thing as the one you saw on the previous slide as the Schrodinger equation on the uh, wave function. Of course, now psi is the field instead of wave function, but the form of the derivatives look identical and therefore it shares the same symmetries. So if you do this substitution of replacing field psi, not wave function, now the field psi by this local phase change by uh, psi prime and the same gauge change for the vector potential and scalar potential, you can verify that this Lagrangian retains exactly the same for form using the new variables psi prime, a prime, and uh, the phi prime. Any questions about this? Okay, and of course, what we have seen the last semester is the relativistic version of this, namely QED, which is based on the relativistic Dirac field. So relativistic Dirac field is psi here, a couple to this covariant derivative, del mu minus IE a mu, is the mass term, it's the kinetic term for the Maxwell field. And for this, you do this again, the phase change of psi, change the vector potential, now full vector potential, so I don't need to write the uh, vector potential and scalar potential separately anymore. So it's much more compact notation. And if you do the substitution, again, you can show that the Lagrangian doesn't change. So hence, this is Lagrangian is invariant under U1 gauge transformation. So the key to this, which I believe we have seen last semester, is the use of this covariant derivative, d mu, instead of del mu minus ie del mu at the partial derivative. So we need to have this minus ie a mu piece so that this derivative is consistent with this local U1 transformation. So covariance of the derivative is defined by this. So d mu, after this phase change from both sides, e to the ie theta, uh, is actually given by this one because the partial derivative will pick up the derivative of theta. And this combination, a mu minus del mu theta, is nothing but the gauge transformed vector potential. And therefore, this is the covariant derivative with a new vector potential. So the fact that d mu sandwiched by between this uh, local transformation will give you the new d mu is the idea of covariant derivative. It's not invariance of derivative because you have to change the vector potential, but it's covariant in a sense that if you change a accordingly, then d mu transforms covariantly. So that's the definition of the covariant derivative. 
And so the gauge field is in this covariant derivative for the purpose of making sure that the derivative is now covariant under the gauge transformation. So I've, if I actually use this requirement, this would generalize very easily to non neighboring gauge theory instead of talking about this expression a mu minus d mu theta, which does get modified when you go to non neighboring gauge theory. So what are you supposed to remember is this, the first piece and the last piece in this equation, namely gauge transformation of d mu gives you new d mu, and that's a definition of the covariant derivative. And we extend this to non navigating gauge uh, theory uh, later on. At the same time, in the QED, the field strength is gauge invariant. And we also would like to understand why field strength uh, is gauge invariant using covariant derivative. And there's one way of writing field strength using a commutator of the covariant derivatives this way. And I think it's, you can easily verify it by, by your eyes. So del mu, the partial derivative in d mu, would act on a mu inside this d mu. At the same time, the partial derivative mu inside d mu would also act on a mu inside this d mu, so that this commutator ends up being a curl, namely the field strength. And it turns out that when you go to non event gauge theory, which is shocking, field strength is no longer gauge invariant. But this definition still helps us to understand why the field strength is gauge covariant, not invariant anymore, but it's covariant because it originates from covariant derivative. So this is another expression we are going to use when we move on to non abelian gauge theory. So that's why covariant derivative is the key to all of the discussions that follows after this. Any questions about that? Okay, so now that we know that uh, the covariant derivative is the key in writing down the gauge theories, we can actually use this. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one more line. So the, this is actually the uh, proof of the invariance of the field strength in the case of this U1 gauge theory. So if you go to a new gauge, D mu is now changed to D prime mu, and so is D prime mu. And we know D mu is given by this uh, transformation. And, and so inside this commutator, the e to the i e theta, e to the minus i e theta cancel when you take the product of uh, d mu and d nu. So I can separate this e to the minus i e theta to outside of the commutator and also the, for the e to the i e theta. And then the commutator is the original f mu nu. But f mu nu is a number which commutes with this e to the minus i e theta. So if I change the order, then this a phase factor here cancels that phase factor over there, and that's how I know that f mu nu is gauge invariant. So that's the case with the U1 gauge theory, like in electromagnetism. And what can change when you go to non nonlinear gauge theory is that f mu nu and a mu become matrix, and so does this gauge change of e to the minus i e theta, theta that becomes a unitary matrix. So as a result then this unitary gauge transformation may not commute with f mu nu anymore. And hence, f mu nu is no longer invariant, but it is at least covariant, so that we can use it to write down the, uh, the kinetic term for the gauge field. So that's the change that's going to happen when you go to non abelian theory. Any questions about this? Again, of course, we go through this uh, with a non abelian symmetry uh, explicitly later on. Okay, so knowing that the covariant derivative is the key to write down the gauge theory Lagrangians, we can apply it, for example, for relativistic scalar field, complex scalar field, because it has to change the phase, so it needs to be complex. So we demand this invariance, and to, we can satisfy this invariance by using covariant derivative acting on the scalar field phi. So this is a scalar QED. So after these changes, and you can show that the d mu uh, is changes in the same way as before because I didn't change anything from the, the, uh, the, the, the electron QED as far as the covariant derivative goes. So that this uh, Lagrangian then is manifestly invariant under this uh, local U1 transformation.
So what we need to do is that we identify the key elements in writing down the gauge theory Lagrangian. So we now try to promote it to a matrix of uh, the gauge transformation instead of just a phase, and hence non-abelian gauge theory. So any questions about this? If this is okay, we I just write, jump right into non-abelian case. Uh, I guess just one question. So okay. each of these three terms in this Lagrangian were justified, or at least the mass term wasn't justified, but it's pretty clear that it's also invariant. Mm -hmm. Are there other terms you could write down in here? So not at the, uh, the, at the renormalizable level, you can also add the phi dagger phi squared, the lambda phi the fourth term. Okay, right. But then anything over but that would it. be not in, it would be either not gauge invariant or it would be not relevant. Uh, that's right, not relevant. Yeah. So you can write term like phi dagger phi phi, that's a relevant operator, but breaks you on gauge invariance, right? Because phi dagger changes by phase once, phi phi changes the phase oppositely twice, so they don't cancel, so that's not allowed. So the only terms that are consistent both with gauge invariance and the uh, 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 the renormalizability is the fight the fourth term. So let me actually write this here. So the only additional term I can write because phi dagger and phi are changed by the opposite phases, so they cancel, so this is invariant. So this is allowed, uh, both renormalizable and gauge invariant, but terms like this is renormalizable, but not gauge invariant, and therefore it's forbidden in the gauge theory. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was just wondering okay. how many terms there Good. could be. So back to slides. Hey, where did it go? Sorry, I don't see the slide now. It's not it. Ah, now I know. Okay, it looks like I can share the slides when the slide slideshow is already in progress. Always learning new things about Zoom. Okay, so that's the the um, uh, the, the the review of uh, the QED or U1 gauge symmetry. So now that we extend this to non abelian gauge symmetry in general, I'd like to give you a quick review of Lie groups and the algebras. So the transformations. Uh, form a group if they satisfy these the three axioms of what is meant to be a mathematical group. So the group has a bunch of elements, label, uh, the name G, little g, and the collection of them is the capital G, that's a group, and little g is the group element. And so uh, they have some kind of multiplication that's associative, so if they need to satisfy this, this requirement. There has to be one element in capital G, named E, which is an identity element, which uh, 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 commutes with all elements and is supposed to be also G, which I forgot to write. So GE plus uh, EG is supposed to G. Okay, that's the second requirement. There must be such an element E. And there also is supposed to be an inverse element for every element in the group G inverse. So G inverse G in G, G inverse is supposed to be the, this identity element uh, uh, given in the previous axiom. So if, if the set capital G satisfied these requirements, we call them a mathematical group. And Lie group is a particular version of a group where this little g can vary continuously. So it's a continuous and smooth group. And just like, for example, spatial rotation, so spatial rotation can be done a little bit or by a lot, 
and you can change the how, ma how much uh, rotation you do continuously. And, and how you do rotation is smooth in the sense that it's infinitely differentiable. So uh, then you say the group is a Lie group. And now that the group is continuous, so uh, you can do a Taylor expansion of various group elements around the identity element, and identity element is the origin, in a fashion that looks like this. So every group element of a Lie group can be written as the exponential of something, and you expand this in a power series of this something in exponent, and so to the extent that you are doing the tail expansion around the, uh, the identity element, you can regard this omega to be an infinitesimal parameter. But now that this omega is supposed to be a matrix, uh, the matrix can be written in terms of some linear basis. So basis here is TA, and A runs from one to the dimension of this uh, the parameter space. So I have, so let's say, N parameters, omega A, uh, that sum together with this basis of the matrices TA. So that's the way you can describe the behavior of the lead group near the origin. And this basis of this matrices, uh, the linear basis, is called the generators. And so, the, in, in, so these TAs correspond to things like angular momentum operators. So they represent the infinitesimal transformations of the symmetry. And when you ex, uh, the, take the exponential of those generators, that will give you the finite transformation that are the unitary operators. So TAs satisfy the commutation relations just like what angular momentum operators do. So in general, these TAs have this commutator, TATB, which should be written as a linear combination of the same basis TC, because that is supposed to be the complete linear basis of all the matrices uh, you need for this purpose. So TATB can be written as a linear combination of TC, and the, the coefficients of this linear combination is called the structure constants. And obviously, structure constants has to be anti-symmetric between A and B indices. And so, the example, as I keep uh, referring to, is a spatial rotation. That's a three-dimensional orthogonal matrices. And so, that for them, the generators are the angular momentum operators, and angular momentum operators are the generators of this symmetry SO3, and their commutation relation is something you know very well. So, so that's how uh, you get the Lie algebra. So these commutation relations among the, operate, the operators or the generators are what is called the Lie algebras. So Lie group are the finite transformations that correspond to unitary operators in quantum mechanics. Lie algebras represent the infinitesimal transformations near the origin, and their commutation relations are something we are familiar with in quantum mechanics among the generators of the symmetries that are Permission operators. Okay, any questions about this? Still have 15 minutes, right? Oh, I, I, I heard somebody departing. Any questions about this? Okay. And oh, so this is just a notational thing. So when the group is SO3 written in this capital letters, then the Lie algebra is referred to uh, as SO3 with the, the lowercase letters in the German fonts. So that's just a notation in the literature. And then there's something called representations of the Lie groups and the algebras. So as I said already, that if you uh, take the exponential of the generators, so J is the abstract uh, operator at this stage, that defines the unitary operators. But when they act on certain Hilbert space, then they are written as a, a matrices. <laughs> so for SO3 rotations, we have this unitary operator, but we, we know from quantum mechanics that when these unitary operators or these generators act on a Hilbert space, you specify the total angular momentum uh, in that uh, subspace of the Hilbert space. <coughs> for example, if you take the uh, spin one half, the generators of the angular momentum can be written this way. This is just a half the Pauli matrices. And exponentials of these matrices give you the finite, the rotation uh, acting on the Hilbert space. If you go to spin one, the Jx, Jy, Zz can be written this way. 
And again, you can uh, uh, work out the exponentials of these uh, matrices to work out what the unitary matrix of the finite rotations are. So when you write these abstract operators in, uh, in terms of the concrete matrices, you say these are representations. And to make sure that they are really representations of the original uh, the, the, the operators, they have to satisfy the same commutation relation. Once they satisfy the same commutation relations, then you say these are the representations for the same uh, the algebra for a particular representation. Okay, any questions about this? So I'm basically just summarizing these names, representations, groups, and algebras. Okay, and there's finally, finally the distinction between what's called compact versus non-compact before moving to abelian, non-abelian. So the compact Lie groups is where transformations would come back. So again, if you think about rotation, which is given by some kind of the generator omega, given by the angular momentum, and t is a parameter. So suppose you gradually turn on rotation by starting with t equals zero, and start uh, doing rotation by gradually turning on t. In the case of rotation, if you do a four two pi rotation, you come back to where you started. So this rotation, by increasing parameter t, would eventually come back. So the space of all possible rotations is closed because of that. And then you say this Lie group is compact. As opposed to non-compact Lie groups, and Lorentz uh, group, uh, Lorentz transformation is an example of this. So in this case, if you do a Lorentz boost, and you can never come, you will never come back. If you can keep boosting uh, to a new reference frame, and you will never come back. So it's an open-ended. And that's why it's non-compact. So the, it's, it's a, the compact Lie groups is if you keep doing transformation, it will come back where you started. For non-compact Lie groups, you can keep going in an open-ended fashion. So that's the distinction between compact and non-compact. And there are specific properties uh, for compact Lie groups, namely that structure constant you saw on the previous slide, which is the uh, defined by the commutation relation, turns out to be totally anti-symmetric. So if you go back to uh, the previous slide, no, no, the further back, sorry. This one here, you have the structure constant. I emphasize that it has to be anti-symmetric between A and B, obviously from the definition commutator, but it turns out that this is totally anti-symmetric so if you interchange B and C, this changes sign. And A and C, that also changes sign. So the, this total antisymmetry of structure constant uh, is a consequence of a compact uh, Lie groups. And we are going to actually use this fact. Also, the, for compact Lie groups, the all finite representations are unitary, uh, can, can be unitary. As opposed to non-compact Lie groups, like Lorentz groups, the unitary representation is actually infinite dimensional. And that's actually what the Hilbert space is in the Fox space for the relativistic uh, field theory, uh, because you know it's open-ended. And, and so it's actually infinite dimensional. You can have momentum of a particle in arbitrary reference frame. You have infinite possibilities for it. So the representation is actually uh, infinite dimensional. You can have finite dimensional representation of non-compact Lie groups if they are not unitary. For example, the way Lorentz transformation works on a four vector is not unitary because the Lorentz uh, the, the transformation is not an orthogonal matrix, hence not unitary. So the finite dimensional representation Lorentz group exists, but they are not unitary. So that's the, the emphasis here. So if you want to have both unitary representation, but also finite dimensional, compact Lie groups do provide that. So as a result of representations being unitary, group elements are represented by unitary matrices, and generators are represented by permission matrices. So this is just a quick summary of what compact Lie groups do for us, and we will be relying on these facts when we talk about the non linear gauge theory. So again, these are just statements, no proofs, uh, but any questions about this? I have a quick question. Go ahead, um, Nick. Nick, right? So, yes. Um, so 
You say that uh, for compactly groups, the structure constants are totally anti-symmetric. Mm -hmm. Does that go the other way as well? If we know that the structure constants are totally anti-symmetric, is it necessarily a compact Lie group? Yes, the answer is yes. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to go into this, and, and I this, I'm speaking of vague memory. So it's kind of surprising that uh, uh, the structure constant only knows about this local information near the origin. But if the structure constant is totally anti-symmetric, which tells you that there's something about the curvature being a, a, a positive everywhere. So that actually ends up telling you, there's called the Meyer's theorem, or Mears theorem, I think, in differential geometry. If the curvature have the same sign throughout the space, then it has to sort of close on its own. And so that's how the local information, which is given by the structure constants, ends up telling you that the whole space closes on its own and becomes a compact B group. Is Does that make sense? Important there as well. Yes. I, yeah, sign is important. So if the curvature is negative, of course, it can go on forever, like yeah, a hyperbolic spaces. The structure constants for the boosts and the rotations are the same, except there's a minus sign. Yeah. So that gives you a negative curvature in the end. Okay. Any more questions about this? Good. Now, finally, we're coming to Abelian versus non-Abelian. So Abelian groups are commutative, namely that every element commutes. So G1, G2 is always same as G2, G1. And that's something we know for U1, that's a phase. So if you multiply two phases, it doesn't matter which order you multiply them with each other. So this is an example of Abelian groups. But if some elements don't commute, then you say the group is non-Abelian, like three-dimensional rotation we've been talking about as an example. So these are just two random elements I picked. But it's, it's clearly uh, easy to see that if you multiply them uh, uh, together, that it depends on the order how you multiply them. So these elements do not commute, and therefore we say the SO3 group is non-Abelian. I think that's it. So any questions about this definition of non-Abelian? It's very really simple, right? And, and so, of course, this goes back to uh, mathematician Abel, uh, the, the, who came up with the, uh, the first incarnation of group theory. Uh, and uh, there is a famous story that he sent his paper on group theory to Gauss for review. But Gauss thought it was a crap. He even didn't read it and, and tossed it out. So it was never published. So it's a very tragic event. I hope that would never happen in modern times. And uh, another thing I learned from mathematician friends is that the fact that Abelian is written in lowercase is very important for them. So if you still, uh, your name's being capitalized, then you are referred to as a person. They haven't percolated yet to an abstract concept, which is mathematician's value. So your, when your name becomes lowercase, then you have made a transition from a living individual to a important abstract concept, and that is meant to be an honor, apparently. So that's why writing Abelian is a lowercase, is we're paying homage to uh, Mr. Abel, apparently, uh, in mathematical culture. So uh, that's why we write non-Abelian with lowercase letters. So if it's Lee did make the cut? Uh, that's a very good question. So how did they make the cuts? How did they decide it? I have no idea. <laughs> So uh, there's uh, some Lie groups, which is not uh, the, in a lowercase and still capitalized. Uh, uh, these are just, again, names. I think I mentioned these things before, but let me, I'm repeating them to you. So when you talk about n by n orthogonal matrices, an orthogonal matrix is defined by this requirement that O transpose O uh, is O, O transpose uh, is the same as the identity element, namely O transpose is your inverse element. Uh, this group uh, is O, N. Uh, the group of all orthogonal matrices. But we often talk about SON, where S stands for special orthogonal matrices, and additional requirement is the determinant of this matrix is one. So if you have a rotation, but you also have parity on top of it, parity reverses orientation, and determinant is negative one instead. So SON uh, excludes elements that reverses orientation among orthogonal matrices. So that's the definition of SON. Similarly, UN is the uh, collection of n by n unitary matrices. Uh, 
And the definition of unitary matrix is that U dagger is the U inverse. And, and so that's the definition of UN. But again, you have the special unitary matrices where you require determinant of the matrix to be one. So in general, determinant of a unitary matrix is a phase. It's an arbitrary phase. So here for SON, you are choosing one out of either one or minus one. So it's only a factor of two here. But in the case of the unitary matrices, requiring the determinant is one, is one out of infinite possible phases. So you are reducing one dimension. So UN has N squared dimension, but SUN has N squared minus one dimensions. So that's a, 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 a big difference from the orthogonal cases. But the nomenclature is the same. And there are many other names for matrices, like a uh, symplectic matrices. You also have the Lorentz matrices, then you were talking about O n comma m. So there are many other names that come up. But uh, in case there is, we only uh, focus on the uh, non uh, sorry the compact Lie groups, and and uh, 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 and also they they have to be simple, which means that uh, that there is no way of reducing the degrees of freedom anymore. U n you can put this extra requirement to reduce it. So this is actually not simple. And SUN is simple because that, that's the sort of the minimum set you can have. And for gauge theories, we use this uh, simple, the, uh, the, the compact lead groups. Okay, so that's the quick summary of the lead groups and the algebras. Any questions about this? Uh, quick question. When do you know when they use like symplectic lead groups and like exceptional lead groups? Because I hear about them a lot, but I'm not really. Okay, so for compact lead groups, uh, uh, sorry, for the compact simple lead groups, there is a total classification of it. So let me go back to the whiteboard. I guess I meant like, I, I know there's a, math, a mathematical classification of it, but oh, okay. what sort of theories would you get out of like symplectic Lie groups, for example? Like what kind of things would they be describing? Uh, you, you're asking the question, what kind of uh, quantum theory, uh, field theory would you use symplectic groups? Right. Yeah, so symplectic groups, SP2N, uh, is a unitary matrix, which has a property that U transpose J U is J, where J is this 2N by 2N matrix. And uh, specifically, where you're looking at the unitary subgroup of it, they called USP. And similarly to SUN and SON, you can have perfectly uh, a healthy quantum field theory uh, they're based on SP gauge groups. And uh, the, it turns out that SP group 2 is the same thing as SU2. So it's actually nothing new. USP4 is it's the same thing as SO5. So again, there's nothing new. But from SP6 and beyond, then there are different groups. And we can write the non having gauge theories using these groups as well. And uh, you also refer to what is called exceptional groups. They come in various varieties, G2, F4, E6, E7, E8. But this is it. So every compact simple Lie groups are either SUN, SON, USP2N, or some of these uh, exceptional groups. There are only five of them. And, and you can write a non neighboring gauge theory, a quantum field theory based on any one of these. Does that answer your question, Andres? Um, I, I guess I guess that makes sense. But what I'm what I was trying to get at is like you know how when we say SC three we think of like quantum dynamics and like other examples ah, like that. Okay. I was okay. wondering if there was like a theory that goes with like I don't. Know I see. So, so you're asking for practical use of them. Yeah, indeed. Right. Yeah, I, I am. I in my theories of dark matter, I actually rely heavily on UP uh, SP gauge groups. Uh, some of the grand unified theories uh, rely on E6 or E8 gauge groups. So these things are actually useful practical purpose of writing down theories of particles and fundamental interactions.
Okay, okay. So for more grand unification schemes, that's what they're Right, doing. right. And also in string theory. Okay, I think time is up. So uh, we go from there. And I will post my slides as well as the, the video uh, later on. So you can look at them later. And we have the office hour from five o'clock. So please show up and ask more questions. Okay. Anything uh, urgent, urgent now? Okay, good. So take care of yourself, stay safe, and see you at five o'clock. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.